Hi, today we're going to do a deep dive into directed energy weapons. Now, the reason we're doing this video is a couple of years ago, we did a video on microwave weapons and then did a follow-up video on defending against microwave weapons. And if you're interested in that, you might want to take a look at those videos. But after the fires in Maui, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in those videos, as well as comments and questions. And it's clear that there are some outstanding questions that people have about the capability of these types of systems. And today I'm going to be joining him just to work all the camera equipment and to make sure that all of these overlays that we're going to be bringing you, he can see them. And if you want to see any of them yourselves in greater detail, you can check it in the description below and they'll all be listed in order. So anyone that you see, it'll be in the following order. Now, to begin with, we're going to limit ourselves to satellite-based systems. We're not going to be talking about directed energy weapons from shipboard or ground vehicles or helicopters that are all dealing at relatively small distances. Satellites have a challenging uh, limitation because of their height, their distance, and because all electromagnetic radiation diverges. It's a physical property of radiation. You can't get a perfectly parallel beam. The divergence is going to produce a challenge because these satellites are pretty high up. If we go to the first page, we can see under Wikipedia, low Earth orbit satellites. That's about as low as we're going to get. And if we look at some typical examples down here near the bottom, you can see, for example, the International Space Station is at 400 kilometers altitude. The Iridium satellites, 780. The Hubble Space Telescope, 540. The Chinese Space Station is at a non-circular orbit of about 340 to 450 kilometers. So we're going to take as a nominal height above ground 400 kilometers. That's a pretty long way up. In addition, these satellites are traveling very quickly. They make a complete orbit in between 90 and 120 minutes. And so they're only going to be over any point in space, time above target, is going to be relatively limited. If we go to the next page here, this is from the Congressional Budget Office, and they are in agreement with a number of other websites by saying the time that a satellite will be visible over the horizon is approximately 10 minutes. That's the amount of time that we have to work with. We also need to figure out what's going to be a weight budget. How large will these satellites be? Because we can't obviously launch a warehouse. And so if we go to the next page about small satellites, we can see this table over on the side where it gives everything from a femto satellite, which is basically like space debris, all the way up to very, very heavy satellites above 7,000 kilograms. But in the mid-range, we're talking about, oh, 1,000 to about 4,000 kilograms. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to assume that we have a weight budget of about 2,500 kilograms, and we're going to attribute about 500 kilograms to the satellite itself, its solar panels, its physical structure, the small rockets that are installed in order to do orbital adjustment, and the other 2,000 kilograms are going to be budgeted to the weapons systems. And there are three major components to that weight that we're going to have to total up. One is going to be the laser, the other the optics, and the third the power supply. Now, as I said, distance is going to be our enemy here. And so what we have to do is we have to look at how big is this beam going to get. So if you go to the next page on beam divergence, Wikipedia page. And on this one, uh, make sure you scroll all the way to the bottom, and it's the last formula that you see here where it says Gaussian laser beams. Just search for that, and you'll see it at the bottom. And don't get nervous. Uh, this may be the only equation that we show you in the entire video, but it's critical to understanding the performance of these systems. And what this says is that theta, which is divergence, is equal to lambda, which is the wavelength of the radiation, over pi times W naught. And W naught is the radius of the beam. And to keep things really simple, we're going to do a little simplification here. 
Let's just assume that W naught is the diameter of the beam and let's scratch the pi. We're gonna make this really simple, a little less accurate, but easier to remember. If we have a wavelength of one micron, which is near infrared, and we have a beam diameter that is one micron, we're going to have a divergence of one radian. What that means is that if the beam travels one meter, at that distance, it's going to be one meter in diameter. It's going to diverge that quickly. If it goes two meters, it's going to diverge to two meters in diameter. Because you almost never see beams of that small diameter, more typically in the optical community, they will use what's called milliradians. In other words, a one micron wavelength radiation over a one millimeter diameter beam will diverge one milliradian, or in other words, one millimeter at the distance of one meter of travel. Now, this is why microwave weapons are simply right out. Thermal damage done by satellite-based microwave weapons is simply impossible. They could do some damage to your cell phone, your Wi-Fi system, maybe even delicate electronics, but they're not gonna generate any meaningful heat. Here's why. Even relatively high frequency microwaves, say 100 gigahertz, have a wavelength of three millimeters. So if you have a beam director or antenna that is three meters in diameter, in other words, a thousand times larger, the divergence is going to be one milliradian, or in other words, one millimeter in every meter of travel, or one meter in every kilometer of travel, or in other words, a 400 meter spot size on the ground. That has a surface area of 120,000 square meters. So to generate the same amount of energy that's being deposited by sunlight, you would need a microwave generator that produces 120 megawatts of power. You're not gonna be able to find that. And to produce anything that's going to really do some damage, you're probably gonna need at least an order of magnitude more power. You're not gonna get a generator that does that. They don't exist. A 1.2 gigawatt generator is not going to be 100% efficient. So you're gonna need power sources that are gonna be in the multi gigawatt range that can fire for 10 minutes. You simply aren't going to get that on a satellite. It is impossible. Lasers are a different issue because the wavelength is thousands of times smaller the divergence with a similar size mirror is going to be thousands of times smaller, and the intensity on the ground is going to be thousands times thousands or millions of times higher. These things might work. Now, if we're talking about lasers, the most likely candidate for this kind of an application is going to be what's called a fiber laser. First of all, it's a very well-established technology. It's in, used in industry all over the place. Secondly, it is the kind of laser that ground-based systems, weapon systems, are being worked on by military groups all over the world. The reason for this is that fiber-based lasers are extremely electrically efficient. They can exceed 50% of electrical energy to laser output. That's great. Secondly, they're completely solid state. There are no free space optics. The way they work is that they have tiny little uh, laser diodes, sometimes dozens, sometimes thousands, that feed their output energy into a very hair-thin fiber. All of these fibers are combined to launch that energy into what's the main lasing fiber of the fiber laser. It's doped with certain elements that will fluoresce and produce laser output. Because everything is hardwired together, it's resistant to vibration, it's resistant to dust, misalignment, it's compact, it's efficient, and you can get them commercially in very high power levels. If we go to the next page here, there are a number of companies that produce fiber lasers in the multi-tens of kilowatts range. Rakus is one. We actually bought one of these things for our laboratory not that long ago. And they're of decent quality and relatively low price. There's another company out there called Trumpf. T-R-U-M-P-F, out of Germany. They manufacture a variety of high-powered lasers, including fiber lasers. Another manufacturer is Enlight. This company became, grew, or became pretty big 
by producing fiber-coupled diodes, the power source for fiber lasers, and more recently got into producing fiber lasers. They have a contract with the U.S. Department of Defense to generate a megawatt-class laser for ship-based applications. So this is being done. But I think the cutting edge has always been a particular company out of Massachusetts called IPG. They always seem to be a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of power and performance. And before you continue, let me interrupt you right there. Uh, Just so everyone knows, we haven't been sponsored and we don't endorse (laughs) any of these companies because, uh, for example, like Rakis, uh, they're heavily based in China. Uh, There's a few other ones that if we had to endorse one, we would pick one out of the other ones, but we don't have any sponsorships. We're not being paid or anything. That's and correct. We, and we wouldn't recommend any over the other. Right. So if you get a fiber laser, do your research. Yeah. Now, if we go to the home page, you can see that these this company can actually manufacture custom systems in the multi-mode range up to 500 kilowatts, <laughs> half a megawatt of power. But if you want to get just a standard model off the shelf, pick the model number, write out your check, you can get lasers from them up to 120 kilowatts. If we go to the one micron range and you look at the second box over there, the tall one, you can see that 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 laser... Just so everybody knows, we're under, in case you didn't go to the link and you looked up their uh, product line, you go to lasers and then high power C- uh, CW fiber lasers. And then you can start with overview, which is where you can see some of the basic information. And then when you go to one micron, then you see what you were saying. Right, the, the, the high YWS. power range of that laser. Yep. And if we look at the optical specifications for this laser you can see this table is very, very important. First of all, you can see on the top, 8 kilowatts, 10 kilowatts, 20, 40, 60, 120. And the important number here, the very important number that is important for a satellite, isn't included on this table. It is the weight and the dimensions of these lasers. So I had to give them a call. And it turns out that even the largest laser weighs about 1,500 kilograms. And the laser that we're gonna be focusing on, which is the 20 kilowatt laser, weighs 725 kilograms. And this is outfitted for an industrial environment. It, It has casters on it. So you can imagine if you were going to be putting this optical system in a satellite, you could remove the casters, you could take off the heavy stainless and aluminum components, replace them with carbon fiber, probably knock a couple of hundred kilograms off of the laser. This would allow you maybe a little bit more weight budget for the purposes of a cooling system and control systems. But let's just stick with the 725 kilowatts or 725 kilograms for the 20 kilowatt laser. And that's why I'm going to be focusing on that because there's another number here. The one that's the second most important after the weight is in the line called beam parameter product. Fiber fed. Beam parameter product is often used almost interchangeably with the divergence. It has to do with the quality of the beam that comes out of a fiber laser, which is excellent. But it isn't perfect. In a one micron laser, if you had a theoretically perfect laser at one micron, that beam parameter product, fiber feed, would be one. So these numbers are low, but they're not one. And this is important because this represents the actual divergence you would get through an actual actual optical system, and therefore the spread of the spot when you eventually get down to the ground. This is why we chose the 20 kilowatt version, because it seemed to have the lowest divergence for the highest amount of power. For example, it has a beam parameter product of four. If you go over to say the 60 kilowatt laser, which has three times the power, its ultimate beam diameter is going to be a little bit more than four, twice as large as in diameter, and therefore the area is going to be a little over four times as much area. The intensity will be lower, and that's why we picked that particular laser. Another little clarification, just in case there's any confusion, on the very bottom line, the beam parameter product process fiber, this is if you plug it into an extension fiber to get it over to your your laser scriber or your laser cutter, that isn't necessary, and it has lower numbers because of the coupling feature. So don't don't pay any attention to that line. 
So now the question we have is, how much weight are we going to need for the power system? These things are efficient, but they're still going to need a lot of power. At 40% efficiency and a 20 kilowatt laser, that means we're going to need approximately 50 kilowatts for the 10 minutes over which we're going to be the target. And the problem is that a solar panel is simply not going to be able to produce that kind of peak power. You'd need an enormous array, so you're going to have to store some power. You could use capacitors, you could use ultra capacitors, but it turns out probably the best choice is simply lithium ion batteries. This battery that I have here on the table is an RC battery. It weighs 1.7 kilograms and it has a capacity of 20,000 milliamp hours or basically 20 amp hours. And if we choose a middle voltage, a mid-range voltage of 12, this means that this particular battery has a capacity of 240 watt hours. For 10 minutes, that means it could produce 1,500 watts. It's actually capable of generating higher peak powers, but for shorter periods of time, for just yucks. Nevertheless, if we need 50 kilowatts, we're going to need 35 of these batteries. And at 1.7 kilograms, we're talking about 60 kilograms. So not that much additional weight. The final component is going to be the beam director, the mirror. The larger the mirror that we can launch this beam from, the smaller the final spot size, but the greater the weight. And that's going to be the challenge because optics, as they increase in diameter, quickly increase in weight. If we pick, say, a three meter beam director, which is the same as we had uh, explained regarding the microwave antenna, this is not out of the range of what a satellite could carry. The Hubble Space Telescope mirror was 2.4 meters in diameter. The web is six, six and a half meters in diameter. So three is a reasonable diameter. It could be uh, kept inside the cowling of a typical rocket. And the weight of a, an astronomical mirror is dependent on its diameter, but also its thickness. And the aspect ratio of a typical astronomical mirror is six to one. So if you have a six meter diameter mirror to make it rigid enough to figure, polish, and to mount, you typically would have a one meter thickness. At three meters, that mirror would weigh 7,500 kilograms, way beyond our budget. But that's a monolithic chunk of glass. And most mirrors nowadays can take advantage of a light weighting process, like this um, uh, page that we're gonna pull up here from Corning. What they do to make a lightweighted mirror is they take a thin disc of either fused silica, ULE, zero door, and on top of the disc, they will place cylinders, either round or hexagonal short segments to fill up the space, the web in between, and then a final piece of bread on top to close off the ends of the cylinders. They'll put it inside of a furnace and they'll run it up to a very high temperature, but not quite the melting temperature of the glass. At that point, the glass becomes sticky and will fuse into a single, mono, a single chunk that is very lightweight. It can be less than 10% of the weight of the solid monolithic mirror. And under Corning's um, webpage here, they indicate that they can even get light weighting that exceeds 90%. In other words, it weighs less than 10% of the solid mirror. So we're down to about 750 kilograms. So the budget that we had set in the beginning, 2,000 kilograms, we're at around 1,500 kilograms. We're perfectly in that range. What kind of beam are we gonna see on the ground with a three meter mirror and a beam parameter product of four with our 20 kilowatt laser? Well, if you do that initial equation, we're not gonna send you back there. You're gonna get a beam uh, divergence of about 1.2 micro radians. That means that at the surface of the Earth, 400 kilometers from the satellite, we're going to get a diameter circle of one half meter. That's really tight. That's a lot of power in one half meter. Problem is, it's not quite that simple. We have one other problem with sending a light beam a long distance through the atmosphere, and that's called atmospheric seeing. Anybody in the astronomical community is very familiar with this. The atmosphere, because it is not completely homogeneous, can have differential densities in front of the beam or heat waves that move across the beam that will distort and spread the 
point or the image that you're trying to produce with the telescope. And a typical spread is approximately four microradians in good clear conditions at yellow 550 nanometer visible light. However, that means that the spot that you could form with a laser is half that diameter, or two microradians. And at the one micron range where we're going to be working, the intensity of the light, or the spread, I should say the divergence caused by seeing, is approximately half that as what it is at 550 nanometers. So if we go to that last insert here, this, that image that you had right at the bottom. And again, yeah, it's at the bottom. So scroll all the way down and you'll see this black and white image here. This is an image of a sunspot that is taken at two wavelengths, one in the green and one in the UV. And you can see the substantially greater resolution at the same time taken of the same spot, or very similar times, in the two wavelength ranges. So with approximately one microradian of divergence, we're going to get a half meter diameter beam. These beam aberrations, though, are additive. Not linearly, not half a meter and half a meter, because they are independent of each other. Their addition is very similar to the root mean square, and so the effective aberration of the combined uh, effects from atmosphere and from the laser is going to produce a beam spread to approximately 0.7 meters in diameter. So we're getting there. The final step is a little bit loose. I'm just going to touch on it because I think that it is likely to be incorporated in the system. It's not necessary, but it's probably what they did. It's called adaptive optics. This is a cutting edge technology. And again, the astronomical community will be very familiar with this. And the laser community is becoming more and more familiar with this. What it involves is using very high speed processors and deformable mirrors and rapid moving mirrors that can counter the effects of atmospheric turbulence and thermal effects and degradation effects in high powered lasers and reduce their ultimate spot size. Now these things can get very, very complex and can involve hundreds of actuators and tens of thousands of uh, processes per second. But it turns out that you get the vast majority of the advantage of adaptive optics with the very lowest orders. For example, high-speed tracking with piezoelectric mirrors that can move thousands of times per second. What they can do is negate the jitter that occurs in a beam as it's traveling through the air and spreads out the spot over a larger blur circle. There's also fast focusing that can move a lens back and forth that can correct for defocus due to thermal effects in the glasses and a laser as well as the effects from the atmosphere. And if you want to get a little fancier, there's X and Y astigmatism correction. With those low orders of correction, fairly easy to implement, and this has been around for decades, you could probably reduce the diameter of that beam substantially. We're going to grant it a little bit of an effect and the likelihood that they use this and simply take that the final spot size was one half meter in diameter, the diameter of either one of these degradation components. I think that's a pretty reasonable number. So at half a meter in diameter, a 20 kilowatt laser will have a beam intensity of 95 kilowatts per square meter, or 95 suns. And the effect of 95 suns of intensity can do some pretty significant damage. Let me show you. Here in New England at about 40 degrees north latitude in the middle of the afternoon and in the autumn, the solar intensity is approximately 750 watts per square meter. The focusing lens we're going to use has a clear aperture of 120 millimeters or a little under 5 inches. So the amount of power hitting the surface of the lens is 8.5 watts. Because the lens is uncoated, it has a transmission of 90%, so the amount of power getting through the lens is 7.5 watts. If we're going to reach an intensity of 95 kilowatts per square meter, we need to focus to a spot that is 1 12,000th of a square meter. That turns out to be one centimeter. Now for you metric people, I'm sorry, but I do not have a darkened scale 
that is in metric. It's imperial. And so one centimeter is 0.4 of an inch. So if I hold this in front of the focal spot, you'll see that the diameter of the focus at the distance that the samples are going to be in is 0.4 of an inch. Kind of hard to hold it super steady, but you get the idea. Now, we're going to start to see what 95 kilowatts per square meter does, and we have a simple piece of uncoated cardboard. I'm going to hold it a little bit in front, just where the ruler was, and you can see that within about a second, it begins to smoke and char, and it doesn't take very long. Maybe a second, maybe two. It's pretty impressive. You can see a piece of uncoated plywood placed at the same distance in front of the spot, and you can see about one second, and we get char. And if we track it across, you can see that this would not have to persist over a, per of a, over a particular area for a very long period of time. And you'll very quickly get this to begin to char. A little bit of wind and this would burst into flame. What's important is that the surface treatments can affect the amount of that seven and a half watts that's hitting them in that spot. For example, if you take a white paint that reflects most of the white light of the sun and hold it at that same distance, You'll notice that it begins to smoke, but I'm holding it here now for about 10 seconds before we begin to burn through the paint and begin to get a char. It's not very impressive and it takes a lot longer. However, if we take a coating that absorbs most of that seven and a half watts and place it at the focus, you can see that the flame begins even more rapidly than on the uncoated plywood or uncoated wood. And it doesn't really matter, it's hard to see the char in the black, but this is charred right here pretty well. Now it doesn't really matter what color. Colored paints are colored not because they generate a color, but because when they take the white light, they absorb all the complementary colors, leaving the blue, in this case, to be reflected. If we place this in that same beam, you can see that almost as fast as with the black paint, the vast majority of the light is being absorbed. And this would be true also with an infrared laser where most paints are highly absorbent. So the colors really don't matter in this case. Now, if we take a piece of tarp, this is polyethylene plastic, and we're gonna put this in the focus, and you can see that it smokes and melts and actually doesn't actually begin to burn but you punch a hole in this thing in just a couple of seconds so it's enough energy for that. If you take a piece of cotton cloth again colored but highly absorbent to visible and infrared radiation within about two seconds this burns a hole and actually we got a fire here. So the point is that that sufficient amount of heat, 95 kilowatts per square meter, to initiate the flame in a bunch of different types of materials. And because of the controversy around blue, a lot of people thought or have suggested that if a laser were used and it were a blue laser, where the paint or the coatings or the materials themselves were highly reflective, they wouldn't be affected by the flame. The problem is a blue laser beam from space is not really practical. There are blue fiber lasers that you could mount on a satellite, but they have a much lower efficiency in terms of energy production. You'd need a much heavier and much larger laser and obviously a much larger and heavier power supply. In addition, although the blue shorter wavelength of a blue laser would have less optical divergence. It will be much more strongly affected by atmospheric divergence. They sort of trade off. So if you're putting a weapon on a satellite and you want to burn things, the color that you're going to use is the direct fiber 1.07 microns of the, of the typical fiber laser. There's no reason to put a blue laser in space just to 
somehow protect blue items doesn't make a lot of sense. Finally, one of the big issues in Hawaii at the time of the fires was a prolonged drought and unusually high temperatures. And they have an infestation of an imported uh, grass, guinea grass from Africa. It's growing everywhere. And because of the dry conditions, the grass has dried out and would potentially be a great source for the initiation of fire. So what I did is I cut some similar grass stems from behind our house a couple of days ago and then just brought them inside so they would have a chance to dry. And we can see what would happen to the grass that's everywhere in Hawaii under that same intensity of light. And just like with the wood, this stuff burns very quickly. And just because of the great surface area of land covered by this grass, it would be the most likely target of a distant laser simply because no matter where you fired it, you would end up hitting this dried grass and initiating the fire. Now 20 kilowatts is a lot of power as lasers go, but the amount of energy that was released during that disaster is measured in terajoules, enormous amounts of heat. So the damage that was done was done by the combustion of the organic materials. The lasers alone, without burning any kind of organic materials, would have done trivial damage. So the lasers from space could initiate a fire, as I've demonstrated, but they wouldn't be the source of any of the significant damage that was done by the heat of the actual flames. So I hope this information puts in perspective the fact that a satellite-based directed laser weapon could in fact start brush fires on the ground. However, I don't believe that's actually what happened in the case of the Maui fires. I had an old instructor once that said, when you hear hooves coming around the corner, don't think zebra. I think the more likely cause of the fires and there's no evidence to support this at this point, but it seems probable to me that it was due to the unusually high winds and a poorly maintained electrical grid that caused some of the power lines to come down to short and start the incredibly dry guinea grass on fire that then rapidly spread because of the high-speed winds to engulf the city and do all of the devastation. But the reason that we did the video was so that you realize that a directed energy weapon is not a million foot high skyscraper. It is plausible. And so the next time your daughter comes in the room and says that the Chinese are starting fires from satellites, you have to admit it may be possible. And where you take the conversation from there is up to you. I wanna thank you very much for watching. Appreciate your attention. And if you like the kind of stuff that we're doing, take a look at the previous videos we did on laser, on uh, microwave weapons and defending against microwave weapons. And if you like what we're doing on the channel in general, please do us a huge favor and subscribe. It really helps us out. It gets YouTube to get our videos out to a much wider audience. And the bigger we get, the more we can afford to do. So stay safe, have fun, and we'll see you soon.